How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Especially because after I got off the plane here yesterday afternoon, I, I go into the dining hall, and much to my amazement, there are sweet plantains. This is heaven on earth. I already liked your campus when I was here in the fall, and then I was having nostalgia of the neighborhood I grew up in, North Philly, which now we would refer to almost as Little Puerto Rico. Uh, sweet plantains are great. But let me, if I were to have an opportunity to have a say in this food committee, which is a great opportunity, let your voice be heard. Let your voice be heard. Not only keep the sweet plantains, but when you take those plantains and you saute them with garlic, oh, just trust me on this one. If things go well today and I have the opportunity to come back at another time, I would hope you were wise in submitting to this exhortation. And that there will be salty, garlic-infested plantains when I, when I come back next time. It's hard to lose a reputation that has been cultivated. I get into a dining hall yesterday, and one of the first things that happened is someone comes up to me and says, you're going to give your tie away again? Actually, I'm not, because I'll tell you why. My wife got mad, and no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, the tie I'm wearing today, it was very interesting. I was giving away the ties Last time I was here, um, one of the students that I gave a tie to um, is actually going to be with us this summer, Lord willing, in Philadelphia, Sean Stewart. Um, right before I left, he came to me and he gave me this tie. I thought that was very kind of him. I haven't used it since. But um, Sean, today, wherever you are, this is the first use this tie is getting um, since you gave it to me. But thank you. This tie is a key to preach at Clearwater Christian College. I am deeply humbled and extremely grateful to be here to have this opportunity to serve you today. I, I'd be honest and genuine in what I'm about to say is that the Spirit of God has been very kind to give me a burden and a desire to be poured out as a drink offering um, for your good and ultimately for God's glory today. And it is my desire that in some small way the Lord would use me to contribute to what he's at work, already at work doing in each one of your lives. And I, I praise the Lord for a promise that I heard this morning as, as I was praying with a couple of the students. We can be confident of this very thing, that if, he's, if he began a good work in you, he will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. What a promise. God is eternally committed to your good because God is eternally committed to to his glory I am so glad that God is eternally committed to his glory and that's what makes missions so exciting that God promises the success of missions because God promises that his glory will be known on the earth God's commitment to missions is simultaneous with God's passion and commitment to His glory. Because God loves His glory and God wants His glory to be displayed in all the earth, God has made another promise. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How great it is to be a part of an unstoppable mission. An unstoppable mission. An unstoppable God. And let us now pray and ask God to help us know our place our role in the unstoppable mission of the investment of the gospel for the glory of our great God and King. Let's pray together. Father, give ear to our prayer and listen to our plea for grace. And we know, Lord, that you will hear our prayer and listen to our plea for grace because we pray in Jesus' name. We pray having an advocate with you, Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, whoever lives above to make intercession for us, so we know that our prayers go to you through him. And so we ask now that you would make us greatly aware that there's no one like you. That a passion for your glory and a passion for the cross would lead to and fuel a passion to take that gospel, to take that message of your glory to the uttermost parts of the world, starting right here in Jerusalem. 
So God, help us. Holy Spirit, may you unleash your presence and your power through your word to serve us and make us aware of what our particular role is in the mission. In Jesus' name, I pray, and we add to that together our amen. I'm so glad that the leaders of Clearwater Christian College have seen the value in having a missions emphasis week. But I would assume that some, if not most of you, approach this week thinking that missions is something that is for some and not for all. I mean, there are two kinds of people in the world, right? Missionaries and non-missionaries. And many of you have probably seen yourself in the not a missionary category. Well, I would like to remind you this morning that we all have a mission. We all have a role in God's mission to display His glory through the gospel. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, 24-7, you have a role in God's passion to display His glory through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the issue really isn't, am I a part of the mission? The issue is, where must I be to carry out the mission? The church has a mission to make much of God through the gospel. We celebrate this gospel in worship. We proclaim this gospel in evangelism. And we live out this gospel through an ever-transforming life that's being brought into deeper and clearer conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. That is our mission. It is the church's mission. Because we are in Christ, we have a part in this mission. Therefore, this mission applies to all. Not to be trite. But we are all missionaries. This mission is not an option. This mission is what every single one of us has been saved for. In part, Jesus Christ lived and died and rose to include us in this mission. It is very humbling, yet very exciting to know that we are the means through which God will make Himself known and His saving power throughout all the earth. Now, although we share in this common mission, each one of you has a particular role in this mission. Your role will be manifested through your profession and the place in which you serve in your profession. It will be manifested in your vocation and the venue in which you carry out your vocation. There is a thing you must do and a place you must be to display the glory of God through the gospel. And some of you will do it through the political world. Some of you will do it through the legal world, through the medical world, through the educational world. Some of you will do it through the popular culture world. Some of you will do it, as many like myself do, through the organized church world. Some of you will do it in North America, some in South America, some in Australia, Africa, Europe, or Asia. And some of you will be really cool and maybe do it in Antarctica. I don't know if Al Gore keeps saying the things he says. Maybe Antarctica will melt or something. Wherever you end up and where, whatever you're doing, you have a part in this mission. And I have been brought here today, thank you, I have been brought here today to talk about where I, by the grace of God, am carrying out this mission. I have been brought here today to be a tool, I suppose, in the hands of God that would compel some of you to see the possibility of you being a part of this mission in the forgotten mission field of America, the inner cities. Today, over half of the world's population live in just 330 cities. Compute that. Over 3 billion people live in just 330 cities. Just to to bring this even closer to home, over one-third of America's population of 300 million live in just 20 metro areas. And Tampa, Clearwater, St. Pete is one of them. These great cities need the gospel. These great cities need local churches to be planted. And these great cities need the gospel to be seen through mercy and heard through proclamation by people like you. I believe there's an urban imperative. We must take the gospel where the people are. So would you please turn to the gospel of Jonah And join me in considering a great city, a great struggle, 
and a great God. I was made aware last night that the book of Jonah was already turned to in chapel this week. And that is by no minor consequence. I do not know what Tim would be preaching on. I know Tim. I know Mark. It's so neat that some of my very own friends have served you this week. And I get to come in here and fix everything they messed up. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> or they'll fix everything that I do that's wrong. <laughs> just after you listen to my message, go back and listen to their messages and see if I was okay. Um, but I was thinking, why would Jonah come up again? I don't know. Maybe the Dean of Men and Dean of Women will start to use the Jonah type of discipline. And instead of demerits, they'll put a great fish in that pool of water outside of, of uh, the building over there. That might, I mean, if you spent three days in the belly of a great fish, you might think again about doing that thing you shouldn't have done. Um, but I, I suppose that we're in Jonah for another reason. And my approach this morning will be a little different. I want to do an overview of the message of Jonah and see if, in looking at the overview of this very short book, see if God would help us get a vision and understand our need to take the gospel to the great cities of the world. Jonah has been dubbed the runaway prophet, the rebellious prophet, the disobedient prophet, much attention has been given to Jonah's bad example. And many Christians have been justifiably warned, don't run from God. I mean, a very theologically sound song penned by the great theologian Pat the Pirate says, if you try to run from God, beware. I think this would be a very effective discipline for my young five-year-old son. Payson, don't do that again. You may be swallowed by a great fish. I think that would be effective discipline. I think that would be phenomenal. I think that might get my son's attention as he seeks to go his own way. We have heard many messages possibly from Jonah that warn us, don't run from God. If God clearly communicates, this is what you should do, then you must do it. And if you don't, God in his mercy and grace will chasten you and bring you back to where you should be. But all those reality, although these realities and principles are present in the short narrative of Jonah, I do not believe that the central focus of the book of Jonah is Jonah. It might sound a little weird, but the book of Jonah is not primarily about Jonah. The book of Jonah is about God. And to be more specific, it's about a merciful God who has a heart for great cities filled with multitudes of unbelieving men, women, and children. If I were to summarize the central theme of the book of Jonah, I would say something like this. That the book of Jonah teaches us that God's mercy for the nations compels him to send his people to highly populated and dangerous places with the gospel for his glory. Long sentence, but it's a long sentence to summarize the overall message and theme of a book of the Bible. And let me say it again, that the book of Jonah teaches us that God's mercy for the nations compels him to send his people to highly populated and often dangerous places with the gospel for his glory. In this book, we find God's merciful heart for the city. In this book, we find our merciful God sending people to reach the city. And in this book, we find our merciful God transforming lives by the power of the gospel in the city. So let's consider how this book points us to a great city, a great struggle, and ultimately a great God. First, this book points us to a great city. The historical setting of this book is during the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians ruled the world for over 1,500 years. The capital city of this empire was Nineveh, which is identified as a great city four times in this short book. In chapter 1, verse 2, notice, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Chapter 3, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Chapter 3, verse 3, now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. Chapter 4, verse 11, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city? What was so great about this city? First, it was great in respect to its size. According to chapter 3, verse 3, it took three days to journey through the city of Nineveh. Many scholars believe that this means that the city of Nineveh was at least 60 square feet because people in that day, 60 square miles, because people in that, Mark and Tim would have corrected that for me, um, 
because it would take, people would only travel 20 miles a day on foot. So because Jonah is traveling through foot in this, in this city, most likely it was about 60 square miles, three days to walk through this big city. It is uncertain what the overall population of Nineveh was, but what we do know from chapter 4, verse 11, that there were at least 120,000 children in the city who didn't know their left hand from their right hand. To kind of give you a point of comparison, within the city limits of Philadelphia, not the metro area, which is about 4.6 million, but in the city limits of Philadelphia, there are about 1.4 million people, and 99,000 of them are children under the age of five. In the Tampa, Clearwater, St. Pete area, you have in this metro area about 2 million people, and over 100,000 of them are children under the age of 5. So why do I say all this? To kind of give us a picture that Nineveh having 120,000 children probably under the age of 5 indicates that Nineveh was at least 2 million plus people. It was a great city in respect to its size, but it was also a great city in respect to its influence. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, and it was from this city that the empire was administrated. It was from the king's palace in this great city that orders were given to unleash Assyria's mighty army that marched across the known world, expanding its borders. It would not be an exaggeration to say that the world was influenced by the decisions that were made in this one city. It was also a great city in respect to culture. Historians remark that Nineveh was known as one of the most beautiful cities ever built. During a trip I took to the British Isles, I was able to, in London, go to the British Museum and actually see artifacts and remnants from the great city of Nineveh. As I looked at a reconstruction of the city gates of Nineveh, I was just awestruck by the grandeur and the beauty of these city walls. It was said concerning Nineveh that the city of Nineveh, covering some 1,800 miles contained famous hanging gardens, water dams, parks, a 50-mile aqueduct to bring water from the mountains, great roads, a double wall protecting the city, administrative buildings, and a large library. Truly, it was a great city in size, influence, and splendor. Nineveh was a great city. Politically, it could be compared to our Washington, D.C., Culturally, it could be compared to our New York, Los Angeles, and Seattle. Educationally, it could be compared to Boston, and architecturally, like Philadelphia. Nineveh was a great city, unlike any in its day, like our great cities all rolled into one. There's something else that was great about the city of Nineveh. The city of Nineveh was also great in respect to sin. Ninevites were not known for being kind people, and that is an extremely... That is extremely understated. You may know that many cities in our country have nicknames. New York is the Big Apple. Detroit is the Motor City. Chicago is the Windy City. Did you know that Tampa has a nickname? I like it, especially for the sake of urban missions. It's called the Next Great American City. I believe that. As I was doing some research on Tampa, Clearwater, St. Pete, kind of understands demographics so I could serve you a little better and connect with you a little better and give you some vision for how you could probably best serve in the Tampa area. I was amazed at all the development. It's one of the fastest growing metro areas on the East Coast. But if Nineveh, oh, well, before I get to Nineveh's nickname, my wonderful city, Philadelphia, is the city of brotherly love. What a lie. <laughs> It should probably be called the city of brotherly shove. (laughs) But if I was responsible for giving it a nickname, I would call it the big cheesesteak. But Nineveh had a nickname. Nahum tells us in Nahum chapter 3 verse 1 that Nineveh was the city of blood. Nineveh's army was infamous for its brutal conduct and barbaric heartlessness. One author puts it this way, when he, that is the king of Assyria, captured a city, he skinned the leaders of the city and publicly displayed their skins. He impaled others on stakes. He cut off arms and legs of others and others he sealed up alive in a wall. Among the average citizens, he cut off ears, noses, and fingers and poked out eyes. Young men and women he burned. It was a city of violence. a city of brutality. A city of blood. But worse than its violence and brutality, the great city of Nineveh had no regard for the great God of heaven. Because of their great sin, just like all sinners, they deserve the just 
and holy wrath of God. God's mercy and patience have been extended for 1,500 years as generation after generation of Ninevites flaunted their pride for the big city that they built, for the empire that they had created. But God's patience had come to an end, and God wanted the city of Nineveh to know, unless you repent, you'll be wiped out. This reminds me of the building of the city of Babel and its great tower. We read in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. That's the great sin of mankind. We want to make a name for ourselves. So why is sin so much more prevalent in these big cities? Because there are simply more people who want to make a name for themselves. Just like those in Babel. The Assyrians built a city to make a name for themselves, and because of it, they deserved God's wrath. See, the problem was not in building a city. It's important to understand that cities and city culture have a, a place in God's paradigm, have a place in God's plan. In fact, cities will be a part of God's plan for all eternity. Did you ever consider the fact that all of the redeemed for all eternity will live in one great city? The New Jerusalem. The Holy City. You might as well come to the city now because you'll be living in the city for all eternity. Tongue in cheek, I think. So, what does God do? God, in His mercy, calls and sends Jonah to this great city that needs to hear what we would call the gospel that God is merciful to sinners. Through Jesus Christ. So God, in His great mercy, God, according to His grace and tender compassion, takes one of His people and says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, for their sin has come up against me, and I want you to preach. And let them know that unless they repent, they will all likewise perish. The great cities of America need to hear the same message that God sent to Nineveh. That God is merciful to sinners through Jesus Christ. But there's a problem. Notice with me, second, that in this book we see a great struggle. Jonah didn't want to go. God says go. And Jonah went, but in the wrong direction. Chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And let me just say this. When, when you try to escape God's call upon your life, you begin to develop a very bad sense of theology. We begin to think things about God that aren't true. I mean, come on, Jonah, wherever he was, God found him and said, go to Nineveh. Why would Jonah think he could escape the presence of God? We get real dumb when we try to escape the will of God. We say dumb things, we do dumb things, we make stupid decisions when we don't consider God in all his fullness. So he tries to go away. Without really trying to spend a lot of time discussing the part of this book that talks about all that happened when he went away, I think what's even more important, what might be more applicable, is for us to consider why did he try to run away? Why did he not want to go to Nineveh, the great city? Why did he not want to be a herald of the message of God's mercy to sinners through Christ? Why did he not want to go? We can speculate a little. Ninevites were arrogant. Ninevites were evil. Ninevites were violent. They were not kosher. They weren't Jews. So Jonah, Jonah runs from the city. And many Christians run from the great cities of our world for some of the same reasons. The people are rude and arrogant. There's violence and crime in the city. It's not safe, whatever that means. There are a lot of people who are not like me in the cities, racially, culturally, social, economically, religiously. So many Christians run from the city just like Jonah for many of these reasons. Christians run from the city, all the while, ironically, depending on the city. Depending on the city for technology, depending on the city for education, employment, information, transportation. Let's not forget the God of this world, entertainment. Many will take from the city, but few will go to the city to serve. Now, although we can speculate pretty justifiably as to why Jonah ran from Nineveh. We, have, we can do better than speculate. 
Jonah tells us why he did not want to go to Nineveh. Look at chapter 4, verse 1, just to give you an idea of what's already happened. Jonah ran away. Jonah repented. And now Jonah has been recommissioned. And now he goes to Nineveh, preaches the message of God's mercy to sinners through Christ. And what happens? They repent. To use our terminology, we would say there was a city-wide revival. You would think Jonah would be praising God. You think Jonah would go, this is amazing. I've been waiting to see a manifestation of God's grace like this for my entire life. Sinners in the masses have come to God in faith. You would think he would be doing celebrative jumping jacks or something. He'd be doing cartwheels thinking this is amazing. God is so great. God is so kind. Look what he has done. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country, meaning before I went? Here's the reason why I didn't want to go. I was back in my country. You came to me, told me to go. And this is what I said, Lord. What did he say? I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Do you hear what Jonah is saying? Jonah didn't want to go because Jonah knew that God would be merciful to the Assyrians. He knew that God was merciful to sinners. He knew that God was gracious to sinners. He knew that God initiates steadfast love to sinners. And these were sinners that Jonah did not want to be saved. This is ultimately where racism and prejudice leads. Our hearts become cold toward those whom God's heart is warm. When God's people avoid the great cities today, it is primarily because of deeper heart issues than the fear and love of, than fear and love of comfort. It may not be on account of racism like Jonah or extreme coldness like Jonah, but nonetheless it's possible that we are willing not to go simply because of the fact that our heart does not mirror the heart of God. So how can our hearts grow so cold? Like how many of you woke up today or even last week before Missions Emphasis Week, how many of you have been moved deeply with the thought of the fact that you are attending a school in a metro area of over two million people, the majority of which do not know Christ. How often have you gone into town, eaten at restaurants, gone to shopping centers, hung out with your friends in Starbucks while you're being passed by a sampling of those millions of people who do not know the mercy of God through Christ. And if you're like the majority of believers, you don't even think twice about it. How could a Christian's heart become so cold and so disimpassioned to see other people receive the message of mercy through Christ? I believe... Just like Jonah, we forget so quickly how merciful God has been to us. When your heart is no longer warm toward the gospel in your own life, your heart will not be warm to want to share the gospel to other people's lives. When's the last time you said to God, God, thank you that I who deserve wrath have been shown mercy at Christ's expense. When's the last time you you cried out to God and said, God, I know that I am a sinner who deserves nothing but wrath, but thank you that you chose to treat Jesus like I deserve to be treated. Did you consider during the Passion Week leading up to Easter that all the suffering, all the agony, all the anguish, all the pain that Jesus endured, He endured for you so that you would never have to face the wrath of God? When we take in the Gospel deeply, 
when we are moved by the gospel daily, we will also be moved to share that message of mercy to those who need it most. Our hearts grow cold towards sharing the gospel simply because our hearts grow cold in having a joy-filled gratitude for the gospel in our own lives. There is, therefore now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that not gospel? Is that not good news? Is it? When Romans 8, 1 and other gospel truths like that become hot in your hearts, you will be compelled to share that gospel with others. Never. If, 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 if I, I leave here, I'm, all, I'm already out of time. This is, this is bad. I'm real, this is really bad because I have a lot more to say. But it's the last day, right? If you get one thing this morning, get this. You, your heart will be warm for mission when your heart is warm with the gospel. Never get over the gospel. Never get over the fact that Jesus died for sinners. Not in general, but Jesus died for you. He bore your curse. He took your wrath. He drank the bitter cup of the fierce wrath of God for you. And my friend, only by grace do you believe that. And only by grace are you saved. My friend, be amazed by grace. I'm convinced when God's people, when the church of Jesus Christ has a restored fervency for our individual and particular redemption, then we will want to go to the lost and say, I want you to have what I have. Today, over half of the world's population live in great cities like Nineveh. And within these cities, the greatest need is not for political reform, is not for better politicians, is not for less crime, is not for community renewal, not for more jobs. These are legitimate needs and we should pray for them. But the greatest need is for sinners to be reconciled to God through Christ. The great cities of America and the world need more than an occasional visit with the gospel. They need more than a drop-by mission trip, although these things are great. They need more than a weekend downreach from the suburban church. The best way for the good cities to be reached is for God's people to live in them, worship in them, serve in them, and to show off the gospel in every God-magnifying, Christ-exalting way. Over 100 years ago, a big city pastor from London named uh, Charles Spurgeon. Have you heard of him? The Metropolitan Tabernacle, one of my urban heroes. He said this about the great struggle that Christians have with living in the city. He said, The worse the people are among whom you live, the more need they have of your exertions. If they be, if they be crooked, the more necessity that you should set them straight. And if they be perverse, the more need have you to turn their proud hearts to the truth. The worse your position is, the more thankful you ought to be that you are in it. Where should the physician be but where there are many sick? Where is honor to be won by the soldier but in the hottest fire of battle? Tim Keller, pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan and one of the greatest advocates of urban missions today, says this astonishing, gives this astonishing exhortation. He says, the single most effective way for Christians to reach the U.S. would be for 25% of them to move to two or three of the largest cities and stay there for three generations. I began to consider this. Can, can you imagine what would happen in Tampa if 25% of this graduating class decided to intentionally move into a Tampa neighborhood for the sake of the gospel? Can you imagine how a community would be impacted, how the community would see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ if just a fraction of you decided to stay here and make much of God in Christ. I think it would be astonishing if Christians began to come together as teams of believers, driven by a vision for the glory of God, driven by a passion for the gospel, to move into urban neighborhoods and watch God work. You can begin that now. You can make preparations for that 
now. Do not forget that God has placed you, sovereignly placed you in your educational years here at Clearwater Christian College in one of the largest metro areas in the United States. My job is not to practically mobilize you for that. My job today is to enthusiate you to be theologically driven to do that. Do it. Do it. There is only one thing that will ultimately overcome our great struggle. And it's not demographic statistics. It's not guilt over the need. It's a vision of the greatness of God. And let me just touch base on this last point, that this book points us to a great God. This book is not primarily about the greatness of the city of Nineveh or a prophet with a great struggle. This book is primarily about the greatness of God. It speaks of the greatness of His mercy. In chapter 1, verse 1, He speaks to sinners. In chapter 1, verse 2, He uses sinners. In chapter 1, verse 2, again, He sends sinners to reach other sinners with the gospel. In chapter 1, verse 17, He chastens those whom He loves and brings them back to repentance. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, He pursues and restores those who repent. In chapter 3, verse 1, He gives us second chances. Maybe you need to be encouraged this morning with this fact. God gives second chances. I would assume I worked in college ministry for seven years. For several years. I went there for seven years. But I was involved with college ministry for several years, especially when I was in seminary. And I talked to to guy student after guy student in the dorms. And you know what? I saw many young men who were paralyzed from being used by God because of guilt over past sin. Let's just keep it real. We stink at sanctification. We are all people in need of change. We are all people who are growing and progressing by the grace of God. And let not Satan, the accuser of the brethren, convince you or lie to you that because of past failures that you have repented of and that are under the blood of Christ that God could never use you. Jonah was a racist and God used him. When you repent and plead for the mercy of God, He will give second and third and fourth and fifth chances. He rescues sinners who deserve His wrath in chapter 3, verse 10. He teaches us the same lesson over and over again in chapter 4, verse 4. And He comforts us even when we're being cranky in chapter 4, verse 6. What a merciful God. So this book points us to a great God who's merciful, but this book also points us to a great God who is sovereign. He is great in His sovereignty and might. In chapter 1, verse 4, He's sovereign over the wind and sea. In chapter 1, verse 17, He's sovereign over a great fish. In chapter 2, verse 9, He is ultimately sovereign in salvation. In chapter 4, verse 6, He's sovereign over plant life. 4, verse 7, over worms. 4, verse 8, wind and sun. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. There's not one square inch of this universe in which we cannot say that Jesus is Lord. Is not Lord. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the sovereign King of the universe. So in conclusion, it is a proper view of God. It is a grasping of the greatness of God that will sustain a heart for city ministry. But even more than that, it is a big view of God that will fuel and catapult us into any role that we are to play in this great mission to see God's glory displayed through the gospel. Guilt will not sustain a passion for city missions. Statistics will not sustain a passion for city missions, but an ongoing vision of the greatness of God will. The gospel of Jonah is that God's mercy not only reaches to great cities with the gospel, but it also reaches time and time again to the obstinate and indifferent hearts of his people who refuse to do hard things and go hard places with the gospel. May God be merciful to us. Let us pray together. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, right before I pray, let me just give you three questions to mull over in your mind as far as application is concerned. And I've asked you to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment, just so you can just focus for a minute. First question I ask you, is your heart cold to that which God's heart is warm? Is your heart cold to that which God's heart is warm? 
If the answer is, I'm not sure. If the answer is, I think so, then here's the solution. Warm your heart with the gospel. Never get over the fact that you who deserve wrath have been shown mercy. And that will lead to a heart that's passionate about what God's passionate about. Second, I would assume that some of you may be called by God to go to the city. But not all of you are. I understand that. But I think the deeper question for you this morning to consider is this. Why are you going where you're going once school's over? What is driving you? Is it the mission? Some of you are going to let your resume take you where you go. You pray and let the Spirit of God take you to a strategic place whereby you will shine as a light to display the glory of God through the gospel in whatever your profession or vocation will be. Lord, thank you for this little book which points us to a great city, a great struggle we all face. But more importantly, you, Lord, the great God of heaven and earth, who is merciful and sovereign, who is still saving sinners in great cities like Nineveh today. Help us, Lord, to know our role. Help us, Lord, to play our part. Help us, Lord, to love this mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.